Okay, welcome back everyone. Today we're going to start uh, chapter 3 in Bio 1314, Anatomy and Physiology 1. My name is Professor Droud. Welcome back. Let's get started. So uh, today we will talk about, uh, of course, chapter 3, and we'll start with Learning Objective 1. Uh, but we'll bounce around a little bit in this lecture, so uh, just uh, stick with me and make sure to look at your objectives. So. Uh, but to start, we'll, we'll talk about some basic components of a cell. And if we started off here uh, with a cell, the, here's our cell. And this red part here is the plasma membrane, also called the cell membrane. And the, the, the function of the plasma membrane is to surround the cell, define the boundary of the cell, basically. Uh, it's made up of proteins and lipids, and we will go more in depth on the plasma membrane in this lecture. The next uh, part, this dark blue here, is the cytoplasm of the cell. And inside the cytoplasm, you'll find organelles, you will find the cytoskeleton, you'll find things called inclusions, which are stored or foreign particles. And you will find um, within the cytoplasm, the liquid part of it is called the cytosol. So the cytosol is the liquid jelly-like substance. Everything else, uh, organelles, cytoskeleton, and inclusions, you put all of it together, you make the cytoplasm. And then this blue I have uh, mapped out here, uh, we call that the extracellular fluid or the ECF. And the extracellular fluid is just all of the fluid that would be outside of the cell. Things like tissue and the interstitial fluid. All right, so let's talk a little bit more in depth about the plasma membrane. So instead of continuing on with objective one, we will switch to objective two. And then we'll come back. So the plasma membrane, as I said, it's the border of the cell and it has intracellular and extracellular faces, meaning boundaries. Uh, the functions are to define the cell boundaries it governs interactions with other cells, and it controls passages of materials in and out of the cell. Okay, here's a look at what the plasma membrane might look like if you were able to zoom in really close to it. So it is made up of mostly phospholipids. It's a double layer or a bilayer, two layers of phospholipids. And there are things like glycolipids, glycoproteins, uh, channel proteins, transmembrane proteins, peripheral proteins, um, and, and we'll talk about all of these today. Okay, let's talk about cell membrane lipids. 98% of the membrane molecules are lipids, and the, the, ma the majority here are, are phospholipids. 75% of membrane lipids are phospholipids. They are amphipathic molecules that are arranged in a bilayer. And that word amphipathic means that part of the molecule is hydrophilic or water loving, and part of the molecule is hydrophobic or water hating or water afraid, okay? And so uh, hydrophilic, philia, is Greek for love. So water loving, phobic, like you could think of a phobia, is water scared, okay? The hydrophilic heads face the water on each side of the membrane. So the water and the extracellular fluid and the water and the intracellular fluid. And then the hydrophobic tails of each side are directed toward the center, avoiding water. They drift laterally. They do not switch back and forth between the inner layer and the outer layer because of the amphipathic nature of them. But they drift laterally, and it keeps the cell membrane fluid. The cell membrane is fluid. It is not a, a uh, structured um, part of the cell. It, it moves around. You can think of it like a, a water balloon membrane, sort of like that. Other membrane lipids. Cholesterol, which is a steroid, uh, constitutes about 20% of the membrane lipids. It holds the phospholipid still and can stiffen the membrane. I like to think of it uh, kind of like uh, it keeps the membrane from being a little too um, a little too loose, a little too watery. It can help it stiffen up some to be a little more uh, shaped. Glycolipids, 
constitute 5% of the cell membrane lipids. And um, glycolipids are essentially phospholipids that have short carbohydrate chains attached to their extracellular surface. And it contributes to something called the glycocalyx, which we'll talk about here as well uh, a little bit. And it just, uh, all of that together, what the glycocalyx is, is a carbohydrate coating on the cell surface. So we'll talk a little more about that later. More membrane proteins. 2% of the membrane proteins, um, uh, they constitute 2% of the molecules, but actually they constitute 50% of the weight of the membrane are the proteins part of the, the membrane, the, the membrane proteins within the membrane. There are integral proteins, which are proteins that penetrate the membrane, things like transmembrane proteins that pass completely through, hydrophilic regions which contact the cytoplasm and the extracellular fluid, hydrophobic regions pass through the lipid of the membrane. Some drift in the membrane and others are anchored in very specific places to the cytoskeleton. The peripheral proteins adhere to one face of the membrane, but they do not penetrate it. They are on the periphery of the membrane, and they are usually tethered to the cytoskeleton. So here's what that looks like. Here's some transmembrane proteins going all the way through. You can see that they get attached to the cytoskeleton to anchor them, but they the hydrophilic region is sticking on the outside and the inside of the cell, and the hydrophobic region is where the hydrophobic tails are of the phospholipids, so that no water is getting to that. Okay, those are transmembrane proteins. Here are some functions of membrane proteins. They could function as a receptor, an enzyme, a channel, a gated channel, a cell identity marker, or a cell adhesion molecule. Okay, we'll talk about some of these now. Receptor enzyme channel, yeah, all of these. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about them now. So, receptors bind chemical signals. They uh, basically uh, are sort of like the eyes and hands of the cell, right? They bind chemical signals in order to process them. Second messenger systems will communicate within the cell receiving the chemical message. So you receive a message, then you have to message within the cell in order to tell them what's going on, tell the cell what's going on. Enzymes, we've talked about this in the first lecture. Enzymes, of course, are proteins that help catalyze reactions, things like digestion of molecules and productions of second messengers. Channel proteins. Channel proteins allow hydrophilic solutes and water to pass through the membrane, right? They allow water from the outside to come to the inside. Some are always open, okay, and some are gated. If they're gated, they could be ligand gated, which means that they only open in response to chemical messengers. They could be voltage gated, meaning that they only respond to charge changes. And they also could be mechanically gated meaning that they only respond to physical stress, really like turning a gear almost. But these ligand-gated, voltage-gated, and mechanically-gated channels are crucial to nerve and muscle function. And so we will talk about these later on down the line in this course. Okay, carriers. Carriers bind solutes, things like salts and other dissolved uh, molecules in water, and they help transfer them across the membrane. They could be pumps, which are carriers that have to have ATP in order to work. Cell identity markers, things like glycoproteins, which are just those uh, phospholipids that have the sugars attached to them, which act as identification tags to let the body know what kind of cell that is. And they could be cell adhesion molecules, which are uh, molecules that mechanically link cells to the extracellular material so that we can stick to things, okay? The glycocalyx, this is what we talked about before. I'll talk a little bit more about it now, but it's this fuzzy coat that's external to the plasma membrane. And there are the th these things called carbohydrate moieties, which are just, moiety just means combinations of glycoproteins and glycolipids. And they are unique meaning the surface markers are unique in everybody, every human, they have unique, except if you have an identical twin. The functions of the glycocalyx include protection, 
immunity to infection, defense against cancer, transplant compatibility, cell adhesion, fertilization, and embryonic development. So that's the glycocalyx. Okay, now we will go back to learning objective one after we've completed learning objective two, and we'll talk about the rest of the organelles here. So organelles are internal structures of a cell that carry out specialized metabolic tasks. You can think of organs as the things that carry out specific tasks within our body. Well, these are like the cells, organs, little organs, organelles. Uh, that's how I think about it. So there are membranous organelles, things like the nucleus, mitochondria, lysosomes, peroxisomes, endoplasmic reticulum, vacuoles, and the Golgi apparatus. And there are non-membranous organelles like ribosomes, centrosomes, centrioles, basal bodies. And so we'll talk about the ones that appear on your, uh, on your list now. We'll start with maybe the most important, the nucleus. It's the largest organelle. Uh, most cells only have one nucleus, uh, nuclei, uh, if there are many nucleus. Nucle if there are many, uh, more than one nucleus, it's called nuclei, but most cells only have one. There are a few cell types that are also anuclear, either which means not having one, or multinucleate, which means having many. The nuclear envelope is a double membrane that surrounds the nucleus. It's perforated by nuclear pores, which are formed by rings of proteins to allow things to come in and out, and it regulates molecular traffic through the envelope. Um, they, they hold the two membrane layers together as well. And so the nucleus, what does the nucleus do? Well, the nuclear envelope is supported by the nuclear lamina, which is a web of protein filaments, and it provides points of attachment for chromatin. Chromatin is loose uh, genetic information. When it all coils up, we call them chromosomes. Okay, so... Uh, that's what chromatin is, but it helps regulate the cell life cycle as well, this nuclear lamina. The nucleoplasm is kind of like the cytoplasm, it's just the material in the nucleus. It contains the chromatin, which is the thread-like uh, DNA and proteins together, and the nucleoli, which are the nucleoli, nucleolus and the nucleoli are masses where the ribosomes are produced. I'll take, show you what that looks like. Here's the nucleolus. And if you see, it's the, this dark, condensed structure within the nucleus of the cell. This is like the nucleus of the cell blown up to be very large. And it is the site of ribosome production, which is another organelle that we'll talk about. Okay, the endoplasmic reticulum, also known as the ER, uh, is a system of channels called cisternae enclosed by membrane. They are membranous uh, organelles. Um, there are two types, the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is a parallel uh, flattened sac covered with ribosomes. So it's rough because it's covered with these ribosomes and it looks bumpy. Um, it is continuous with the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. So uh, if we went back, you can see continuous from the nuclear envelope is the rough ER. Okay. Um, it produces phospholipids for the membrane, right, and proteins of the plasma membrane. It synthesizes proteins that are packaged in other organelles or secreted from the cell. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum lacks ribosomes, so it's not bumpy, therefore it looks smooth. The cisternae, which are the folds, are more tubular and branching, and they're thought to be continuous with the rough ER. Uh, they synthesize steroids here and other lipids. They detoxify alcohol and other drugs that you may ingest. And also calcium storage happens here. The rough and the smooth ER are functionally different parts of the same network. So when you talk about the endoplasmic reticulum, it's important to, to differentiate the smooth and the rough because they do different things. Here's what that looks like. Here's the rough endoplasmic reticulum with all these ribosomes studding the surface. So it looks rough, and here is a smooth, ER, a smooth ER without the ribosomes. Okay, vacuoles. What are vacuoles? Well, vacuole is just a mem another membrane-bound cell organelle. And in animal cells, they are generally very small. You can see them like very just dotted throughout the cell. And they basically are just sacs that help sequester waste products. 
In plant cells, they help to maintain water balance, and often there is a very large central vacuole that takes up most of the interior space of the plant cell. And so that's a vacuole, just basically storage units. Think of it that way. Ribosomes, we talked about ribosomes a little bit. What do they do? They are small granules of protein and RNA. They are found in the nucleoli, where they're made in the cytosol, and on the outer surfaces of rough ER and the nuclear envelope. They read coded genetic messages called messenger RNA, and they assemble amino acids based on that message and combine them into specific orders to produce proteins. Okay, we'll get much more into that when we talk about protein synthesis and DNA and RNA replication. The Golgi complex, or the Golgi apparatus, we'll call it a complex here, is a system of folds, like those cisternae again, that synthesize carbohydrates and puts finishing touches on synthesis of proteins. It receives newly synthesized proteins from the rough ER, it sorts them, splices them, adds carbohydrate moieties to some, and packages them into membrane-bound Golgi vesicles. And then those Golgi vesicles right over here, they send them out to where they need to go. Some of those vesicles become lysosomes. Lysosomes are organelles that help break down other products. Some vesicles migrate to the plasma membrane and fuse to it, and some become secretory or secretory vesicles that store a protein product for later release. Lysosomes, I just said, they are packages of enzymes bound by a membrane, and they're generally round, but they vary, they vary in shape. Their functions are to do intracellular hydrolytic for lysing or cutting or digesting proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, phospholipids, and other substances. They do autophagy, which is digestion of the cell's surplus organelles. Same eating is what autophagy means. And autolysis means to same cutting or cell suicide, which is digestion of a surplus cell by itself, to get rid of itself because it's no longer needed. Here are what lysosomes look like. Here, look, here's a mitochondria, and next to it are these lysosomes. There's a Golgi complex. So this is a, a, a scanning electron microscope view of an actual cell. Okay, you've probably heard quite a bit about mitochondria, uh, but what, it, what are they all about? Um, so they are organelles that are specialized for creating ATP, or the cell dollar, uh, what the cell has to use in order to do work. They continually change shape from spheroidal to thread-like, and they are surrounded by their own double membrane. They have the inner membrane, which has folds called cristae, again, and the spaces between the cristae are called the matrix. The matrix contains ribosomes, enzymes that are used for ATP synthesis, and small circular DNA molecules. Mitochondrial DNA is, uh, is very special, and we'll talk about that in just a second. They are the powerhouses of the cell. I'm sure you've all heard that before, but they are what is used to produce ATP, which eventually is what is used to get energy in order for the cell to do work. Here's what a mitochondrion looks like. This is an actual one. You can see the matrix, you can see the folding cristae, you can see mitochondrial ribosomes. Very nice, very cool. Uh, that's what a mitochondrion looks like. So, and a little bit about mitochondrion. It is known, and it is, it is well uh, theorized, that mitochondria evolved from bacteria that invaded another primitive cell, survived and did not get breaking down, and survived into its cytoplasm and became permanent residents. The bacterium provided an inner membrane and the host cell's phagosome provided the outer membrane. Mitochondrial ribosomes resemble bacterial ribosomes. This is, this is evidence for this. Mitochondrial DNA resembles a circular DNA of a bacteria. Mitochondrial DNA gets inherited through the mother. That's just a fun fact. Your mitochondrial DNA is the same as your mother's. Mitochondrial DNA mutates more rapidly than nuclear DNA, which is also similar to uh, um, uh, Bacterial DNA, sorry. It's responsible for things such as hereditary diseases that affect tissues that have high energy demands. So some cool stuff there about mitochondria. 
Next, we'll talk about microvilli. And this is going back to a little bit uh, about of learning objective two, when we talk about extensions of the membrane and parts of the cell membrane. Well, microvilli are extensions of the membrane that help increase surface area. Um, they're best developed in cells that are specialized in absorption. One example is your stomach. Um, it helps the, the stomach absorb nutrients. They appear as almost a brush border. Um, and some of them contain actin filaments that are tugged toward the center of the cell to get to milk absorbed contents into the cell. So here's what microvilli look like. These are not organelles, but they're extension of membranes. Pretty cool. Cilia. Cilia are, are um, hair-like structures that are 7 to 10 micrometers long. Uh, a single non-motile primary cilium is found on nearly, nearly every cell. It's an antenna, basically, for monitoring nearby conditions. It helps with balance in your inner ear and light detection in your retina. Really cool. But you could also have mo multiple non-modal or non-moving cilia found in the sensory cells of your nose. Ciliopathies are defects in the structure and the function of cilia. So if you have a ciliopathy, you have a defect in the structure and function of your cilia. Motile cilia, or moving cilia, are found in the respiratory tract, the uterine tubules in order to move egg cells down, ventricles of the brain, ducts of the testes, and there are 50 to 200 on each cell, and they beat in waves, sweeping material across a surface in one direction. What happens is it beats one way, and it's called a power stroke, and it beats the other way, called a recovery stroke. Okay. How uh, cilia look, there's an axoneme. It's the core of a moving cilium. Uh, it has this very famous nine to two structure of microtubules. Here's what that looks like. Two surrounded by nine pairs. Okay, so whenever you think about nine two, you're thinking about the core of a cilia. Uh, dynein, which is a motor protein, uh, the arms of that motor protein actually crawl up adjacent microtubules which makes them bend. So that's a really cool video if you've never seen it. And this, this of course, uses energy from ATP. Okay, so we talked about cilia. Let's talk about flagella, which is like a tail. And one uh, example of that is the tail of a sperm. And it's the only functional flagellum that you'll find in humans. We don't have other functional flagella in our cells. Um, it's a whip-like structure with an axoneme identical to cilium, but it's much longer and it's stiffened by coarse fibers that support the tail. But instead of that power stroke recovery stroke, this movement is more undulating and snake-like, like a corkscrew. Okay, so that's flagella. Let's talk a little bit about the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is a network of protein filaments and cylinders that give structure to the cell, determines the cell shape, supports structure, organizes the contents of the cell, directs movement of materials within the cell, contributes to movements of the cell as a whole. That's kind of what your skeleton does. This is just the cell skeleton. It's composed of three major structures, microfilaments, intermediate fibers, and microtubules. Microfilaments are six nanometers thick. They are made of actin protein, and they form a web, a terminal web. Intermediate filaments, slightly larger. You'll find them within skin cells, and they're made of a protein called keratin. They give the cell shape and they resist stress. Microtubules are the largest. They are 25 nanometers thick and they consist of protofilaments made of, pro of a subunit called protein tubulin. Radiate from the centrosome, which is another organelle we'll talk about, and they can come and go. They can be produced and they can be taken down. They maintain cell shape, hold organelles, act as a railroad track for walking motor proteins, and they make axonemes of cilia and flagella, and they form the mitotic spindles. So there's a lot of stuff that they do, uh, but just stuff to put to memory. Here's a look at what microtubules look like. There are polymers of that subunit tubulin. These little circular balls here are individual poly uh, monomers of tubulin. You put them together to make the polymer microtubules, and they provide structure and shape to eukaryotic cells. Okay, centrioles. Centrioles are organelles that are short cylindrical assemblies of microtubules that are arranged in nine groups of three microtubules each. 
two centrioles lie perpendicular to each other within the centrosome, which is a small, clear area in the cell. They play an important role in cell division, and you'll learn more about them when we get to that topic. They form the basal bodies of cilia and flagella. Each basal body is a centriole that originated in the centriolar organizing center and then migrated to the membrane. Here, let's take a look at centrioles. So this is what centrioles look like. They are structures of microtubules. They're kind of like the star shape. Pretty cool. Okay, that is the end of learning objective one and two. The next video, we will start learning objective three for chapter three.